Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Well, praise the Lord. We welcome you to Christian Living 101. We want to thank you for watching today. I hope that it will be a time of uh, inspiration and encouragement as you serve the Lord on a daily basis. We're going to go into the Word of God in the book of uh, uh, Second Peter. We're going to take a couple of verses of the last uh, chapter of verse 1 and then proceed on down through chapter 2 uh, if we have the time. I want to talk to you today about something that I really think is important. You know, we look around us and uh, uh, we realize that with the modern technology and all of the things that are going on in the world today, the great uh, ability to communicate and have uh, so many multitudes of voices um, on the internet and uh, actually on the air, uh, giving uh, their opinions and and spreading their doctrine and some of it is uh, good uh, much of it is very very bad Peter warned about that to the early church uh, and he warned about it at a time when he was aware that he was getting ready to go home to be with the Lord he mentions that uh, the Lord had revealed unto him that his days was short and he felt the urgency to write this second book to the early church to warn them of things that were already happening, yes, even in that day, but also in the days to come. And I think that it's important for us to spend a little time on it because I think we need to be careful that we don't become gullible to all of the false doctrines, all of the pretty sayings, all of the attractions of the various cults of the world as they try to spread their poison in the world, denying the Lord Jesus Christ as the Redeemer and Savior, and denying uh, the Christian faith. And so I want to talk to you today, if you're interested in really serving the Lord, if you are already serving the Lord, you need to be very, very careful to make sure that what you hear and accept in the modern technological world today of the internet and uh, high technology, that uh, we come to that place where we don't accept that which is not true. Well, you say, Pastor, how do I know what's true and what's not true? Well, the best way I can tell you, oh, I could say, well, you need to listen to me. No, I won't tell you that because every man, including me, is capable of making a mistake. I hope I don't. I never intend to give you any portion of the Word of God that is not absolutely 100% true, but I want to remind you that all people, including, yes, this pastor, are vulnerable to imperfection. Yet, I want you to know that when we do give you a study, we've tried very hard to give you the scripture that proves what we are speaking at the time that we speak it, and it comes up right on the screen, and I hope you can follow along with it. I use the King James Version. Yes, I know that's an old, old version, but I also know that it is one of the most correct uh, interpretations of, of the original writings in the early church and in fact in the Old Testament era as well. I'm going to read to you a verse in 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning with verse 17. Now this is the Apostle Peter uh, speaking out and uh, giving warning unto those he was writing to in that day, including all of us through the centuries up until this day who are still studying the Word of God and trying to live our very, very best uh, to keep it 
and to be instructed and guided by it that we might glorify our Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father who loved us so much that He sent the only begotten Son of God to die for us at the cross of Calvary that we might have life and have it more abundantly throughout the ages to come. So now Second Peter chapter 1 verse 17 speaking of God for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased now I don't know if you remember exactly where that happened but as I recall it was uh, after Jesus was baptized came up out of the water and uh, the Almighty Heavenly Father spoke unto all those round about and they heard the voice of God now can you imagine hearing the voice of God at a time like that and that voice declared this speaking of Jesus the Christ this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Oh, as I look forward to the days when I go to meet the Lord, I hope that I can hear those words from my Lord. And I trust that you can wish the same. Verse 18, And his voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. You'll remember perhaps that three of the disciples, uh, Peter being amongst them, uh, went up on the mountain with the Lord and they had a visitation again from the Heavenly Father there. And uh, we want to, I'm going to skip verse 19, you can read it for yourself if you'd like. Verse 20 I think is important to, uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It was given to holy men of God even in the Old Testament. And so we need to recognize that just uh, anybody can come along and we have a lot of them doing it today. Well, you know now, I'm a prophet. Oh, really? Well, you know, I'm an apostle. Oh, really? Who said so? Oh, well, there was some organization that I belonged to that uh, uh, they uh, uh, declared that I was a special anointed and uh, uh, blessed their organization. And, and so they gave me a title. Well, you know what? Men can give lots of titles and men can put out lots of words claiming, Thus saith the Lord. Well, sometimes it is thus saith the Lord. Those men that are anointed by the Holy Spirit, that speak under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit, we refer to it today in modern language, and it's certainly very valid, but there are multitudes who take that approach, and God is not in it, they are not speaking for God, though they declare that they are, and they speak words that are not true and deceptive. Uh, they have a, a gift of the old devil uh, to have those soothing, persuading words that come forth, even as he come into Eve and said, oh, you know, Eve, God didn't really mean what he said. I know God told you this and he told you that. And yes, I know all of that. Uh, but you know, if you would just listen to me, you go ahead and eat of that fruit God told you not to touch. Oh, he didn't really mean that. He's trying to keep you from knowing all of the gods of this world. If you just eat of that fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll know, oh, well, you'll be like a god. Well, that started it all, didn't it? Now, you say, well, you're blaming Eve. No, I'm blaming Adam because Adam knew better. Adam was not deceived. Adam yielded to the request of the one his wife who was deceived. And so I want to talk about don't be deceived. Beware of false prophets. And how do you recognize them? Well, Peter started in chapter 2 with these words. 
But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destructions. Something interesting here. You know, we uh, have a tendency to think, well, all of our problems is coming from the obvious works of the evil, dark forces, uh, people that are obviously not serving the Lord. But I want to tell you something. They're a lot easier to recognize than those that have listen to the gospel, that have read the Bible, that have rejected it in their spirit, but they find a pleasure in deceiving and becoming the voice of Satan himself as they speak words that are not true. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. In other words, pernicious means uh, disguised or uh, deceitful. It's a, a, a word that uh, uh, includes lots of things, but it generally applies to those who have heard the truth, know the truth, have even at one time perhaps accepted the truth, and now have rejected it and have turned against the kingdom of God and his people and with their pernicious, deceitful, uh, unsettling and yet so sweet sounding words they are spreading doctrine that is absolutely false and untrue. Why do they do that? Because they don't want to serve God. They become embittered by something I've had people say to me, well, you know, I started out serving the Lord, and, and I really meant it when I, I accepted Him as my Lord, and, and uh, I thought that uh, it was going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, but you know what? Uh, God didn't do anything for me. You know, uh, I had this little situation, and I, I uh, prayed, and I just said, Lord, take care of this for me, and, and uh, uh, nothing happened. And he said, uh, uh, well, you know, there was another situation that came along, and uh, I found that God doesn't keep his word, and, and so uh, uh, I don't really believe that stuff anymore. They may tell you, well, I'm really a prophet. They'll not tell you the story about their past. Uh, I'm really a prophet, or I'm really an apostle, or I'm really anointed of the Holy Spirit to be a teacher, and uh, I'm going to uh, guide you in the paths of righteousness. Of course, they don't give you any scripture. They don't teach you any word of God. When they do bring a scripture to you, it's been twisted and, and defiled by their own thoughts and, and uh, intersected with... Uh, uh, their own words uh, and uh, the Word of God contaminating it and it sounds so good. You say, well pastor, is that happening today? Oh, the internet is full of it, the airwaves are full of it, television is full of it, it is everywhere and you'll find the number of people that are claiming to be the anointed of God the absolute final word of spiritual things are teaching anything but the truth, never or at least seldom mentioning the Son of God, the Lord and the Redeemer that died for you and me on the cross of Calvary. They have smooth words, pernicious sayings, words that have meaning that you have to guess at but because they sound good, they become acceptable as truth. Tremendous deception nearly always comes from those within the so-called body of Christ, but who are there as imposters and not there as genuine believers converted and changed and delivered from the bondage of the law of sin and death by the power of the sacrifice of Jesus' blood. Verse number three, and through covetousness, fraudulently shall they with vain words make merchandise of you, 
whose judgment now the long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Say, what in the world does that scripture mean? Well, the best description I can have of it, and I know there are some of you that never watch a movie or haven't seen many movies, but uh, back when I was younger, uh, I used to enjoy the Western movies that came out, and uh, though I've uh, uh, rarely attended a theater, they uh, would come out in one form or another, and, and I would uh, be able to see them on the TV or some other place, maybe on a movie screen somewhere at a gathering. And uh, there was always, or not always, but there was often uh, the medicine doctor who came through town and he had his little bottle of medicine. They called him, they called those people the snake doctors because they were con artists. And they had this little bottle, and oh, it was a cure for everything. And guess what? People would say, hey, I need that. That sounds so good. I'm going to buy that. And they would spend their money, and they would buy everything the old guy or the young guy had to offer. With a smooth tongue, he would sell his wares. And as soon as he had got their money, he got on his horse or uh, in uh, the carriage, and he took off down the road and never to be seen again. By the time the people had tried it and knew that it was fake and didn't do one thing for them, long gone was that individual. Now this third verse is talking about the people who peddle false doctrine and it sounds so good and so perfect and the minute that you discover that, wait a minute, I don't think that's right. I don't think that that scripture is in the Bible, or it's certainly not in the Bible with that kind of meaning. And uh, they begin to investigate and begin to check it out. And by the time they learn that they've been duped, long gone. The so-called evangelist, and there are some good evangelists out there, don't misunderstand me. But the so-called evangelist that was selling his snake oil as truth, and I use that as a symbol, in presenting the so-called Word of God, but presenting it in a way that was absolutely untrue and false. But so smooth that it was hard to recognize unless you really knew the Bible and the Word of God. Oh, there's some smooth customers out there today. They're doing their very best to... Uh, to uh, uh, defile and deceive and destroy the Christian community, those who believe in the miracle working power of a holy God who created all things, those who believe that he loved people enough, uh, his people enough, that he gave his only begotten son that they might have deliverance from the bondage of the law of sin and death. Oh, they're out there, and yet they're in there, many of them right in the circle of the congregational of believers. Sowing the seeds of disruption, sowing the seeds of deceit, sowing the seeds of terrible, terrible, terrible lies. And I want you to know there's only one way to recognize it, and that's go to the Bible. Well, I heard you say, Pastor, that you're a King James man. Well, yes, I do use that because. I'm old enough that when I grew up, there was only two or three other interpretations or uh, Bibles that had been uh, produced uh, on the market. Two or three, maybe four. Today, there must be a hundred. And are all of them accurate? No. Are all of them really an interpretation or a translation of the original manuscripts? No. Very few of them are. Most of them are based on the uh, translation that was brought forth in the early Bibles, but has been altered and modified with their opinions and with uh, 
modern language that does not have the same meaning as the original language. And so, am I saying you have to stick with King James? Of course not. There are some good ones. And there are those that are real and genuine and pure and sound. But one of the Bibles, uh, uh, well, I won't say one, some of the Bibles that uh, are on the market today and are very, very popular have left out great portions of Scripture. And they have rewritten other portions of Scripture that give a total different meaning than what the original translation was. And that's what Peter was warning about even back over 2,000 years ago when he wrote this scripture. Verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, and cast them down to hell, delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, verse 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now, we think that word today, it means talking, holding a conversation, holding a uh, a gathering of exchange of ideas and thoughts and so forth, or a time of listening to someone teach. It's a, we think of that as conversation. The original meaning that that conversation word has uh, uh, taken the place of is uh, the meaning of the daily activity, the characteristics, the actions that we perform in our daily living style. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, uh, we hear a lot today about body language. How many of you have heard about body language? Can't hardly turn on the news without somebody saying, well, their body language was this and this. And well, somebody else says, well, no, their body language is like this. And you begin to wonder what in the world. But the truth of the matter is, our actions speak a lot louder and give a lot stronger message than what our words do. And even you as a Christian can take a lesson from that. Because there are some of us that encounter those that uh, have a wonderful, wonderful knowledge of the Bible, they speak the scripture so beautifully, but their method and their actions and their activities and what they live is 180 degrees from what they say. So their whole conversation, whether it be verbal or through the actions of the body, the mind, and the spirit, is all a lie. Can you tell the difference? God will help you tell the difference if you check everything by the Word of God. Check it out. See if it's in there. Go to verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from the day to day with their unlawful deeds. Oh, it was their sin, their unlawful deeds, the corruption of their spirit and their soul. It was uh, uh, the way that they lived their life. And uh, we know that it's talking about Lot as he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah among a city or two cities close to each other, that were filled with the immoral homosexual practices that were so corrupt that God declared that they were not to be condoned in any measure. Oh, Pastor, you're in trouble. Yeah, probably I am. But I want to tell you something. I'd rather tell you the truth and have you be aware than to have the gullible uh, folks that uh, are not too prompt in understanding the scripture 
to take whatever they hear, 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 and uh, uh, they began to put it all together and they say, oh, that let them do what they want to do. Let them be what they want to be. I mean, after all, it's none of my business. Well, if you're a child of God, it's one of your businesses. Because you and I should find no spiritual exception. Excuse me. I didn't say exception. I said exception of any of that doctrine. It's filthy, ungodly, unwholesome, and damnable unto eternal damnation. Verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Think about that. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. That word temptations again is uh, so narrowly explained today. Temptation means, uh, well, would you like a piece of pie? And uh, you're on a diet and uh, you say, uh, uh, no, I don't think so. Somebody else comes along and they say, I'm sure you'd really like this piece of cake. And uh, no, no, I don't think so. I better not. And here comes a third one and says, Hey, I've got the best tasting dessert here I've ever tasted. I think you'd enjoy it. Oh, well. Well, this one time. Now, that's temptation. But the real full meaning of temptation is the trials and tribulations as well as that kind of temptation that comes against us every day. When the enemy fights against you, you are enduring a temptation that is being brought upon you that is unholy and unrighteous and uh, you have to battle against it and come against it and reject it out of hand with no questions, no well maybes, no entertainment of what it's all about. No. I will not, and I'm going to come against that. It's not going to be part of my life. I'm going to stand my ground, and I am not going to be one of those who waver back and forth as I try to walk through this world serving Almighty God and my wonderful Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. Pastor, man, that sounds awfully harsh. Just what the Bible says. It says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That means even the ways in which he appears to be stable is not stable, is not solid, is not absolute and positive in his position or, or his lifestyle or his doctrine or his attitude, whatever it may be. And so the warning was, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and he knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. I want to speak to that word unjust. And I want you to understand as I am teaching this, it's my responsibility under the anointing of God and the declaration of God when he called me into ministry that I am to teach the truth whether it's easy or whether it's not. And sometimes I have to preach things and I feel obligated before God and directed by the Holy Spirit to teach things that are controversial to the world. But they're not controversial to God. God's Word supports what is declared. Verse 10, But Chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Now I want to clear something up here. The lust of the flesh, uncleanness, that means uh, the impurity, the sickening, filth, sewage, 
of the words of men and women who claim to be abiding upright citizens. But down inside, they live a different life than what they want you to think of them when they are in your presence. I had an interesting conversation with a couple just a few days ago who shared how they were deceived and misled and misdirected and literally trapped into situations that was abominable in the sight of Almighty God. But by the grace of God, the Word of God came to them. They understood that the Word of God was the Word of God. And they understood the error of their way. And by the grace and the mercy of God, they were converted. They serve the Lord today with all of their heart. And they come to that point of obedience in the Scripture. But there are so many that want to put on a front. And they live one way out here in the world. When they come to church on Sunday, or Wednesday night, or Tuesday, or Thursday, or whatever it might be. Oh, they're so holy. They're so pure. They have the words of the Christian community so perfectly learned that they can just spew out a wonderful, wonderful pretext of spirituality. I just want you to know something. If you're one of those people listening today, you need to know you may be deceiving those that you are standing in front of and living that fake life before, but God knows who you are, God knows what you are, and God knows how to take care of you, and you better repent and get right with God, or you're going to spend eternity in the damnable judgment of uh, eternal damnation. Oh, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know what you don't know, and I don't know what you don't want to know. But I do know what I know, and I do know what God speaks is true. What are you going to do? Just this last week or two, there was a terrible murder that took place. A family slaughtered by one or two persons. I think just one, but they don't know for sure. And what did the people who knew him, his close friends, they caught the one they think did it, but they're not sure about another being part of it. But those that knew who had been caught said, Oh, I can't believe that. They were so nice. They were so peaceable. Why, they, they, their kids played with my kids. I fellowshiped with them. I've uh, had them to dinner, and I've eaten dinner with them, and... They were, they were just good people. I can't imagine how this man could do what he did. But you see, what he pretended to be those he wanted to like him was just a facade, just a covering, just a falsehood, an imitation, and not the real thing. Down inside of him was corruption, evil, meanness, ungodliness that not one of his acquaintances, friends, or neighbors suspected. I want you to know, beloved, be careful. That's what Peter is saying here to the people he was writing to in those days. It's been preserved for you and me to learn from, and I trust we'll listen carefully. Verse 11, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. 
that despise government. That was in verse 10. I want to make a comment about that. The Bible says that we are to be respectful of government. Oh, we're supposed to accept all the evil of government? No. This word government means those in authority over us, especially in the body of Christ, the kingdom of God. The words that we hear today, we need to go back and look at the original and see what it was really talking about. And you'll be amazed what you find. Because you see, with every generation, the meaning of words change. What one word in the scripture meant even 50 years ago means something totally different in our language today. Really? Really? I don't understand. Well, that's because probably many of you that are listening are young. You've not had training in the Word of God. You've not had training in the culture of kindness and upright living and tenderness and compassion toward others that so many have. Now, I'm going to make somebody angry again, but I can remember when I was a, a young preacher several years ago, uh, many years ago, there was a word that was really wonderful. It was a three-letter word. It was G-A-Y, gay. It represented someone who had good taste in clothing, a beautiful dress, a very um, fine-looking suit, a very happy disposition, full of life and happiness and joy and fun and everything was positive and wonderful. Well, I think we all know what that word stands for today. And it's anything but pleasant and wonderful. Let's go on to verse 11. I read it already, but I want to read it again. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, Bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. We need to be careful about bringing railing accusations about someone. And believe me, there's a lot of that that goes on today. Just uh, gossip that somebody passed along becomes fact. And it becomes a railing accusation and paints someone that may be totally innocent as a terrible person. That's wrong. It's ungodly. It's sinful. Even the angels of heaven will not represent someone and accuse them before God. The angels themselves will not do it. We better be careful what we do. Well, let's go on. I... No time is coming up short here pretty soon. I want to cover some more of this. Verse 12. But these, we've heard this before, listen to it. But these as natural brute beasts, that means the oxen, the elephants, the horses, beasts of burden that are used for hard work. Many brute, be a natural brute beast, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. If you begin to bring charges against others to God or to God's people, or to the world, accusing those that you don't even know what you're talking about, and even if they are exactly what you say. You need to be careful how your accusation goes forth because remember God knows everything. He knows who's what, what they think, how they think, how they function, and how they believe, and how they live. 
word of God that they keep and every act of disobedience and rebellion against God that they keep. He knows it all. You need to understand that God knows who you are, what you are, and how you are. Pastor, you're hard today. No. I'm just telling you words that you need to hear because there's so much deception in the world today that it would be easy for you to be deceived. And what was Jesus' first words to the disciples when they sat down with him? In Matthew 24, they asked the Lord, Lord, tell us when all these things are going to come to pass that you've been talking about. What was the first words he said unto them? Be careful that you're not deceived. You see, the whole world is full of deception. And sometimes it's hard for those of us who are not on our guard to pick through the lies and distortions and misrepresentations and evil motives and purposes and find that nugget of truth that is so precious. So I'm giving you just part of one chapter and another in the entire Word of God that warns you about these things. I want to say one more thing about verse 12. These who do those things are going to actually have what they have accused others become the portion and the force of their own judgment and destruction. It will come back upon them. Be careful. Be careful, folks. Verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. Still talking about those who, uh, as brute beasts, bring accusation. They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They're in our midst, folks. They're in our congregations, people. Be careful. While they feast with you, this is what they're doing. Verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. That's describing the people that we're talking about that are liars, deceivers, and so forth, and false accusers. What are they really like? They have eyes for adultery. What's adultery? It's immorality. A lot of people say, well, that's when someone who's married has a sexual relationship with someone else. That's just a little tiny part of it. Lots of ways of adultery. Spiritual, social, economical, on we could go. What do they do? They beguile. That means they entrap. They entrap unstable souls. There's something about these people that they have a sense and awareness of who is weak and open and will receive them without question. That should cause us to want to become strong, well-founded, well-rounded, and well-established on the rock, the Word, Jesus Christ our Lord and Redeemer. Verse 15 which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now who was Balaam? He was a false prophet. He wanted to be liked by all of the kings, all the important people of the world, and all he could spew out stuff that sounded so good. But the day came when they said to him, I want you to go come against this righteous man. This man that's 
speaking the word and the truth of God. I want you to come and I want you to prophesy against him. What happened? You know, I've had people say, oh, you know, animals never talk. No, I don't think they do, not in the language that you and I understand. But the Bible says something that's very plain. God can speak through them very clearly. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved his wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet and put a stop to what he had determined he was going to do. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about those who are so smooth and deceiving and spread untruth, lies, deception, steal, immorality, ungodliness, on and on. They're filled with it. And he's saying, these are wells without water. Oh, there's a well out there. We've heard stories about people who have been out in the desert or a long way from water. And over there, just a little way, there is a well. No, it's not really just a vision. There, there is a, a well there. And so, with great effort, they get to the well. They're anxious to find some water to sustain them. They're hungry, they're open, they're in a receptive position and attitude. They need some help. But that person who pretends to be filled with the waters of life is nothing but a hollow, dry cistern that has no water in it. Oh, the words they speak will sound good, but there's no life in them. The thoughts that they bring forth are wonderful, but there's no power in them. The things that they declare to be so marvelous and truthful and factual sound good, but there's no foundation in them. They are wells that have the appearance of life-giving flow, but they are wells without water. They are clouds that are carried about with the tempest, with the wind. How many times here in Arizona do we see clouds in the sky? Oh, my, they come and they go. They're dark, some of them. Some of them are almost greenish and, 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 and black. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, bright and beautiful and so puffy and wonderful. But if you need rain, there's not a drop in them. They'll come. You'll see them afar off, you'll watch them, and as they come, they come a little closer, a little closer, they get overhead. You're looking for some sprinkles, and there isn't any. You look, you want, you wonder, you pray, you hope, but there's no, there's no water in them. The world is filled with people who look wonderful, act wonderful, talk wonderful, present themselves as wonderful, have a, a, a tremendous a people a, a power and ability to influence others, and uh, they look so good that they're nothing but rotten on the inside. Well, got to go on. I want to read this one last verse. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it. That word known means experienced it. It doesn't mean have knowledge of it. It means have experiential knowledge of it. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Well, I'm going to read verse 22. 
But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, I don't know how many of you have been around the hog pen. We hear about the prodigal son that went and uh, ate with the hogs. The hog pen is filled with the urine and the feces of the hogs and mixed with the water of the rain or the water of the slop, the garbage that is fed to them. And uh, when uh, uh, they have gorge themselves with the, the trash, the garbage that they eat, they lay down and they wallow in that mire that is nothing but the feces and the urine of the herd. And Peter said, the people who do the things I'm talking about are just like the dog that comes back and eats his own vomit and the sow that uh, wallows turns over and bathes herself in the sewage of the lot. Not a pretty picture, is it? Well, I've got a much pretty picture to give you. There was a day when Jesus paid the ultimate price that you and I might be set free from all of this we've been talking about today that we might be genuinely converted and our soul, our spirit would be changed within and the law of sin and death that had entrapped us is gone, cut, broken, removed and the fullness of the radiance and the life and the glory of God fills our spirit and the righteousness of Jesus Christ quickens our soul, and all things become new when we're converted. With that, beloved, it's time for me to go to communion. I trust that you will receive it with reverence. Speaking of Jesus, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You know when you're going through grief and hard places, you want to remember that Jesus walked that path before you did. And he knows the pain of it. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. We thought he was a criminal. We thought he was getting what he deserved. We thought that he had committed some terrible, terrible atrocity or something and he was being crucified for it. That's what they're saying. It says on verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
With that, beloved, we take this little piece of bread. It represents the flesh that was torn from his body as he stood at the whipping pole, tied there while Roman whips came down across his back and body and bared his very bones. He took that so you and I can call upon him and find the strength, the miraculous intervention, the wonderful blessings of his gift to us. And as we eat it, let us remember that it paid for the needs we have in this world and it is a symbol of the healing stripes that he bore that you and I might be made whole. With that, let us eat together. Now we take the cup. Represents the shed blood that dropped from his body. As he hung on that cruel cross. Nails in his hands, thorns on his head. Spear in his side. Paid it all. That you and I might be set free from the chains of death and hell and eternal damnation and given in exchange membership in the holy, righteous, pure, perfect kingdom of God throughout the ages of eternity. Father, as we drink this, we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us. If we violated you, Lord, if we violated the trust that uh, you put in us, if we've uh, had our eyes or our thoughts or our minds upon other things, then we should. Cleanse us anew. Refresh us in your spirit. Lord, let, let us take of this without any blemish because of your purification of our life and of our being as we drink this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we declare it, Father. Amen. Let us drink together. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at ChristianLiving101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050, or email Gene at gene, with a G-E-N-E, -E, gene at christianliving101.org.